Thank them for our continuing use of the natural recess, uh, resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We're thrilled to be able to present this event virtually in the midst of concerns surrounding public health. Tanhala is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity. I'd like to thank uh, David and Steve for appearing tonight um, to help make that happen. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing uh, the stream via our YouTube page. Uh, to enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Uh, the video will be available for re-watching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Many other organizations within our community are uh, presenting free or virtually accessible content, so we encourage you uh, to look up those um, in this time, um, such as Seattle Arts and Lectures and the Northwest Film Forum. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain to do, due to the recent wave of event cancellations. We hope you will consider extending your generosity, generosity to help support us during this difficult time uh, by making a donation by clicking the donate button at the bottom of your screen, or you can always become a member. Our partner booksellers have also been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak and can use your, your support as well. If you're interested in supporting uh, local independent books, uh, bookstores by purchasing a copy of tonight's book, um, we are partnering with Third Place Books tonight, and you can purchase the book through the button uh, that is just at the bottom of this page. Tonight's conversation is going to be about 45 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A portion. Our moderator will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom uh, center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions you'd like uh, the speakers to answer first by clipping, clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We can't guarantee that we'll get through all the questions, but we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. John Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of the members watching tonight. And now on to our speakers. David Rode is an exec executive editor of uh, NewYorker.com. He is a former reporter for Reuters, uh, the New York Times, and the Christian Science Monitor. He was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for international reporting in 1996 for stories that helped expose um, the Srebrenica massacre during the war in Bosnia. And in 2009, he shared a Pulitzer Prize with a team of Times reporters for the coverage of Af Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's the author of Beyond War, Reimagining America's Role and Ambitions in the New Middle East. Also, A Rope and a Prayer, the story of a kidnapping co-authored with his wife and Endgame, the betrayal, betrayal and fall of Srebrenica, Europe's worst massacre since World War II. Steve Scher is a podcaster, broadcaster, writer, interviewer, and teacher. He's the former host of KUOW FM's Weekday and has taught interviewing at the University of Washington since 2009. His in-depth interviews with award-winning authors, political leaders, scientists, artists, and active, active citizens are noted for their intelligence and sensitivity. He moved into podcasting, excited to be part of the social movement that is democratizing access, and is currently chief correspondent of Town Hall's Insider Podcast, In the Moment. Steve is also the host of the podcast series at length with Steve Scher. Rhodes book, In Deep, the the FBI, the CIA, and the truth about America's deep state is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming David Rode, Rode and Steve Scher. Thank you, Thank Candace. Thank you, Candace. Very nice. Thank you, David. It's good to see Thank you, you through the magic of this uh, technology. <laughs> Thank you, and the thanks everybody who's, who's watching. Uh, there yeah, was a messenger on the slide look. that said, uh, Steve Share rocks. That was one of the yeah. posts I saw. So we're off to yeah. a great start, thanks to you. That's that's my that's my friend and neighbor and former uh, <laughs> journalist. <laughs> former journalist, Chris. <laughs> he, we, we walk our dogs together when we can. I guess not right now. We're not walking our dogs <laughs> together right now. Got to take it. Any support you can get anywhere. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, where are you right now? Uh, I am in my uh, my my parents-in-law's house. Uh, I'm in uh, Kennebunkport, Maine, 
Uh, I usually live in New York City. Uh, my wife has asthma and reduced lung capacity, so we left the city as the COVID outbreak was spreading. Uh, so we are, we're here in Maine and we're safe and well. Um, I've talked to a lot of my friends in New York who are still there and are very worried about them, but it does look like things are getting better. Seattle has set a good uh, example for the country um, in flattening its curve. In many so. ways it has. Yeah. In many ways it has. That's true. That's true. Well, I'm glad you guys got to be in a place where you're m more comfortable in all the ways that you need to be more comfortable. Yeah, we're lucky. You know, uh, it's funny what you said about Seattle, because here's here's what I was thinking, and, and we could start with this. When the um, protesters uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, came to Olympia to complain about the uh, infringements on their personal freedoms because of um, because of the uh, the restrictions of, from social distancing and others, uh, one of the signs, more than one of the signs, that were they were holding up as they gathered together, much closer than six feet, was no more from the deep state. How do you suppose in their thinking, the um, response to COVID-19 is a symbol or a represent, not a symbol, but an action by the deep state? So um, the conservatives sort of uh, have a, I know we'll talk about this, different people use the term different deep state in different ways. So to conservatives, and I'm guessing these protesters, uh, their view of the deep state is sort of, the term I use is the administrative state. And that's this kind of ever-growing uh, federal government, state government that's relentlessly encroaching, uh, they feel, on Americans' lives, you know, on their, their rights to, you know, uh, vaccines, uh, gun control, uh, education, you know, curriculum. And so they feel that, you know, uh, the deep state, the warnings about coronavirus are exaggerated. And it's another example of unelected uh, government officials, sort of elitists uh, in Washington, dictating to average Americans how they should live their lives. I see. Well, let's define it. Let's take all the de definitions of the deep state. Um, when did that term first come to be uh, prevalent? So one of the reasons I tr I wrote the book was to try to come up with a clear definition of a of the deep state, and I've actually come to the conclusion that I don't I don't really like the term. It's used in a lot of different ways. It's a pejorative term, but it actually started out as a term that political scientists used to actually talk about the military in con in the country of Turkey and the the dynamic in that country of the military and intelligence services blocking the emergence of democracy in Turkey. It was sometimes applied to Egypt, same thing, Egyptian military kind of blocking the emergence of democracy there. And it wasn't really used or applied to the American government. The earliest example I found of it was a book written in uh, 2007 by a University of California, UC Berkeley professor named Peter Dale Scott. I, I tracked him down and interviewed him for my book. His view of the deep state, it fits more of a, another, you know, uh, I mentioned this earlier, um, another view of kind of an oppressive government, the way liberals view it, they don't use the term deep state, but they talk about the military industrial complex. And that would be a set of, you know, generals and defense contractors that sort of push the country in endless war. So Peter Dale Scott's definition in 2007 was much more along those lines. Uh, defense contractors, he was suspicious about how 9-11 came, came about. Um, but also very suspicious of Wall Street and, and their power. Um, so until 2007, you know, he did some interviews on Infowars, Alex Jones's show, and that was sort of an example of the left and the right coming together and their, you know, suspicion of the federal government. Um, but before 2016, you know, the term deep state just really wasn't, I think, widely in use among, you know, average Americans. Did you talk to any conservative deep staters? I'm going to use that, uh, who, <laughs> who saw, who, who uh, recognized the concern of the military industrial complex, historically yeah. or currently? I mean, there is unity. Um, one person that, you know, has brought this up and comes to mind is Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, the libertarian Republican. And he's, you know, very nervous about the U.S. being dragged into wars overseas, extremely skeptical about, um, you know, the National Security Agency and surveillance. And then uh, his 
kindred spirit uh, is uh, Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, the liberal, who's also very concerned about eavesdropping and that there's too much spying going on in this country. So, you know, th there is growing distrust of, of the federal government. Uh, there was a poll I read in 2018 that really set me off into writing the book, which found that 70% of Americans think that uh, there's a group of unelected officials and military officials who secretly manipulate U.S. government policy in Washington. Uh, you know, I always think about when uh, in the run up to the campaign, Donald Trump was asked about his support for Russia, given all the negative things that Russia had done in the world. And Trump's response, I think it was to Bill O'Reilly, was, you think we're so great? We're not so great. We're not so innocent. You know, we've done a lot of things, too. I always thought that was an interesting response. And I, I wonder if, do you think that resonated with some of the people who came to support Donald Trump? I think it did. And I think, you know, there's people who, you know, mock Donald Trump and question his mental stability. He's extremely good at messaging. He's very, very good at consistently, you know, presenting a narrative that appeals to people. And in terms of, you know, what the U.S. has done around the world, you know, he's right. Um, I start my book in uh, 1977. There was a huge investigation by the Senate. It was called the Church Committee. Frank Church, the senator from Idaho, chaired it. And they investigated, you know, FBI and CIA activities throughout the Cold War, and they exposed, you know, assassinations. Uh, the CIA was spying on Americans inside this country. They were surveilling John Lennon when he uh, protested against the Vietnam War. Uh, the FBI, you know, is, it's famous for wiretapping and harassing Martin Luther King Jr. and trying to defame him. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover had a list of 26,000 Americans that were subversives, in his view, that would be rounded up in the, you know, if there was a, in case of emergency, Norman Mailer was on that list. Uh, and anyway, it was amazing number of scandals, but what's changed and what Trump didn't mention is that there were this, this whole system was created in the late seventies. President Ford did it after Watergate, uh, President Carter as well to try to control the FBI and the, and the CIA and, you know, current, Member, they talked to a lot of people, uh, current and former members of the FBI and CIA, and they claim that they've operated differently uh, since all these um, protections and oversight mechanisms were, were put in place in the late 70s. Hmm. I guess until uh, Abu Ghraib and Watergate. Well, you know. Uh, I mean, Watergate, Abu Ghraib <laughs> and the Iraq War. Well, <laughs> you got me. But we <laughs> well, no, that's yeah. true. And yeah. so there's a. Well, there's, well, um, go ahead, keep going. Well, I, I, did, you, did you interview Rand Paul for this book? Uh, I did not. Uh, he, I, I tried to speak with him, but he, he declined to, to speak I with me. I just wonder what he would say. I mean, would he, I, I mean, in some ways, his politics might uh, look back on the 70s reforms and say, yes, these were concerns. You know, I mentioned that I grew up in Chicago where a bunch of Black Panthers were killed by, uh, you know, uh, through through very very underhanded means. How's that? <laughs> so I, I wonder what's, you know, do we come around? You said, you know, Alex Jones, who I don't yeah. know if he ever, he just goes around like this, but uh, does he, d d do, is there a coming together of the concern about the deep not state? I was going to say big I, brother. <laughs> not, not among um, mainstream Republicans and, and mainstream Democrats. I mean, there was a lot of, Look, the these these systems were put in. There's a federal court that's supposed to, you know, the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which we'll talk about, um, that approves warrants for eavesdropping. There's new committees were created in Congress, the Intelligence Oversight uh, Committees, uh, Ron Wyden's on them, uh, and the idea was to have courts overlooking uh, eavesdropping. That you had to have a warrant to do that. If you were a member of the FBI. Uh, there was a ban on assassinations abroad that that Ford signed uh, for the CIA to carry out a covert action in another country. It had to be written, and then the president had to sign a covert finding. Copies of that finding went to the uh, leading members of Congress from both parties. Um, uh, CIA directors were supposed to serve, I'm sorry, FBI directors were supposed to serve no longer than 10 years to prevent J. Edgar Hoover from emerging. And, you know, all these congressional committees have subpoena power. They can demand to see any documents. Um, and this is much more extensive than what other countries have. There aren't in, you know, committees in the legislative bodies in England or Germany or France that can 
subpoena those countries' um, intelligence services. All that said, I know there's a bunch of people out there who say, you know, this is a joke, uh, they're out of control. Just, you know, to go to 9-11, um, the, you know, detention and torture practices that went on were approved by the Bush administration. The Justice Department wrote, you know, famous legal opinions saying that this was legal. Um, CIA officers who, you know, were involved in that uh, said they were, you know, following the orders. They were lawful orders that, you know, by a duly elected president. It wasn't rogue operations. That would have been the difference was that the CIA and FBI were sort of doing things on their own more during the Cold War. But, you know, I get it. People don't believe it. Um, in terms of assassination, Barack Obama, a Democratic president, you know, carried out a record number of drone strikes that, you know, when it were in essence assassinations. And there was even one of an American citizen, Anwar al awlaki was uh, killed in, in Yemen by a U.S. drone strike, no court proceeding, no public presentation of evidence. And uh, a U.S. citizen was, was killed by the U.S. government. Yeah, pretty remarkable numbers on that, reading it again in your book. Well, all right, we'll come back to that, but let me circle back to the sure. beginning. So these these 1970 church committee reforms, the post-Watergate reforms more broadly, did they curtail presidential power? Did they shift power from the executive to Congress? They did, and then and the kind of broader question of the book is sort of how do you control the CIA and the FBI uh, and also like, you know, prevent them from carrying out abuses. And then how do you prevent presidents from doing that? And so there was a, a school of thought and Bill Barr, the current U.S. Attorney General, is part of this group. But so when Ford agreed to all these changes, um, two members of his staff, it was actually Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, both of them worked uh, in the Ford White House, opposed this. Uh, Antonin Scalia, um, who was then a conservative legal scholar and went on to become a Supreme Court justice, felt that after Watergate, the creation of these oversight committees. Uh, there was also the creation of inspectors general. You know, they've come up a lot in terms of the spending of the emergency funds for coronavirus. Uh, those were independent, apolitical uh, positions uh, created by Congress, and they were supposed to, you know, uh, investigate spending and abuse uh, and corruption in the executive branch. And there was a school of thought, and Bill Barr is a big member of this, that essentially the presidency, you know, was being weakened too much. Uh, there was too much oversight by Congress, too much subpoenas from these congressional committees about what the executive branch was doing. Uh, and then Bill Barr gave a speech about this recently to the Federalist Society. He felt there was too much activism from judges, too many liberal judges. He's an opponent, for example, of abortion rights. He saw that as the courts going too far. But in terms of the president's power, he felt uh, he complained about just recently uh, under President Trump, these immigration orders that would be stopped by uh, federal judges. There were several on the West Coast that stopped, you know, uh, things Trump was trying to carry out. I think the the Muslim ban, as it was called, and he just said that's overreach. That we need a strong presidency to protect this country in moments of disaster, pandemics like today, and moments of war. And Barr argues that the presidency, more than the legislative branch, more than the judicial branch, has actually performed the best when the country is under threat. And he favors a, a strong presidency that can't be, uh, you know, encumbered or or slowed down in its actions by these other branches. Two questions on that. One is there is there any evidence in your reporting in the world that we have seen uh, a this is a little bit like evidence by you know, we we don't really have the example, but is there any evidence that that, that a strong president has done? Uh, a better job than the legislatures uh, or the legislature here in Congress uh, over in, during times of crisis? You know, Barr would argue that um, post 9-11 uh, that the president needed to detain uh, suspected terrorists and put them in Guantanamo Bay. That was the president opening up the prison and running it um, as he liked. Uh, the Bush administration, uh, you know, they ran a warrantless wiretapping program. They did not go to this federal court and ask for warrants. They, again, felt that was needed, and most Americans supported it after 9-11. Um, but th this is a big debate. And, and it, you know, if you fast forward to today, you have this, you know, belief among Barr and other conservatives in, in you know, the strong executive. And then you have Donald Trump, who uh, welcomes that power uh, and, you know, says he wants it at times. I mean, we can get into the coronavirus response, but 
Um, he's sort of gone back and forth on, you know, I am the ultimate authority as president to, you know, it's up to states to decide. But I, I'll just, these are central questions about, you know, how should our democracy function? Should all three branches be, you know, equally powerful or, or do we need a strong presidency? So it's, we're sort of living through an amazing moment in American history. Well, I had thought that the founders wrote the Constitution in such a way that they were three co-equal branches of government, which would put checks and balances on one another. What would Bill Barr say to that? It, it, Article two of the Constitution, you know, describes, a, you know, an executive branch that has full authority over the, you know, carrying out, executing the laws and, and you know, uh, running the government as the chief of the executive branch sees fit. Um, that's his view of the Constitution, and there are conservative scholars who agree with that. Um, and to be fair, Congress has really struggled. I mean, you can't, it's so divided politically, we're so divided politically, it's not that, I can't think of a big legislative package that kind of emerged from Congress in the last few presidencies uh, where Congress was sort of leading the way. Um, anyway, there's a sense that since 9-11, the presidency has kind of regained whatever power it lost uh, post Watergate. So when Donald Trump says, I'm the president and I can do whatever I want because I'm the president, uh, the, they and they point to Article 2, there's nothing else in the Constitution that I can point to that says, no, wait a minute, I thought there were some oversights that uh, it's, go, come into play. The main mechanism is an election. That's, you know, Barr's primary thing is that, you know, the the executive will be held accountable in, in regular elections and impeachment um, are the two main mechanisms. So I can I can uh, hope that they will always uh, then respect the outcome of any election or the outcome of any impeachment. I mean, when they if they say their uh, their power is uh, all encompassing, they can also say this impeachment proceeding is a fraud and we won't comply with it because we don't have to because we're the executive. Isn't that, well, isn't that part of the argument they make? That's part of the argument, and that's what happened with the, the recent impeachment proceeding, that it was just a political proceeding. To be fair to Bill Barr, he, you know, there was a period recently where uh, Trump was pushing him to uh, go easy um, on Roger Stone's sentencing. And Barr gave this very unusual interview with ABC News where he said, you know, the president's tweets and demands that the sentence that Roger Stone, you know, received be less was making it impossible for Bill Barr to do his job. So I think there is a red line. Um, one of the things that, you know, came out of uh, the Watergate things and these scandals from the past was that uh, the attorney general uh, under Nixon, um, you know, John Mitchell was sort of punishing as attorney general was punishing the president's enemies and helping his friends. So attorney generals are supposed to apply the law equally um, a good explanation I heard, and I didn't really understand this before, was that um, if the president wants to say, let's go crack down on pharmaceutical companies, that's my priority for law enforcement and the Justice Department, an attorney general should absolutely do it. That's the president's prerogative. Again, and I want to emphasize this, presidents are elected. They have democratic mandates from the American people to carry out their policies, and government servants you know, should carry out those policies unless they're illegal or improper. What is improper is if, you know, the president says to the attorney general, hey, I don't like that, you know, that one um, pharmaceutical company CEO because, you know, that person didn't give me a large uh, campaign donation. Go criminally investigate them. You know, that is improper. And Barr has signaled that that kind of activity uh, is improper. Um, but it's again, it's all extraordinary what's happening today. What about his own uh, approaches to investigating Ukraine or investigating uh, Biden, investigating the FBI, uh, whether their decision to uh, investigate Trump was legal? Are those political or are, can, can they be seen as the duly responsible efforts of an attorney general? And th this is where I, th I think there's more problems with, with Barr's record. So just today, the Republican controlled, I want to repeat that, the Republican controlled Senate Intelligence Committee ruled that the CIA assessment that Russia intervened in the 2016 election to help Donald Trump was correct. That is, that, that is based on the evidence that you know, the intelligence community collected and that all these Republican senators saw, they agreed 
that this wasn't some you know fake story to discredit Donald Trump. It wasn't some plot you know by the intelligence community by the CIA to make up uh, that that Russia helped Trump. Russia, in fact, did help Trump. And right now, uh, as part of the probes, you know that you mentioned, Bill Barr has uh, had a U.S. attorney, uh, John Durham, is carrying out a probe of those CIA analysts. You know, was their assessment correct or not? And there's a separate part of their investigation of the FBI and what they did, and we can talk about that separately. But it was a, a big boost, um, you know, for uh, these intelligence analysts who find it very, you know, extraordinary that they're being investigated by a U.S. prosecutor uh, for, you know, a report they wrote. It was their assessment of what Russia did. And so one of the most puzzling things and, you know, concerning things is, you know, this pattern of sort of investigate the investigators. Um, anyone who kind of comes out with a, an intelligence assessment that the president doesn't like, you know, faces a criminal investigation. And I, that's had a real chilling effect on the intelligence community. Uh, we could talk more about this, but the head of the FBI, Chris Ray, and uh, Gina Haspel, the head of the CIA, are testifying less and less in public today because when they do, um, senators will push them or journalists into saying things that contradict President Trump. Uh, you know, he'll tweet at them, he'll attack them. Uh, Dan Coats, the director of national intelligence, he said the assessment of the intelligence community was that North Korea wouldn't give up its nuclear weapons. Trump then mocked him, um, you know, and he was sort of forced out of power. And the person Trump has nominated as the new director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, is much more political and much more likely to give intelligence assessments that align with the president's messaging. Well, it's... It... It's difficult because the line of the between political and um, exactly. neutral, which is what we're supposed <laughs> to see these folks as being, is so difficult. Yep. So you mentioned uh, the the uh, BBC comedies, Yes Minister, and I forget what the <laughs> other one was called, um, about the permanent secretaries of departments who um, manipulated and maneuvered around the ever-changing cast of political appointees and the prime ministers in the UK. And um, uh, they were the power in, the, in that, in that uh, TV show, anyways. How much truth do you as ascribe to that notion of uh, with the, uh, the sitting um, you know, people in power in these various departments today? And then we'll get to the political appointments, because I know that's sure. part of this. But do those so folks have the power? They they have they have large amounts of power. There's no question. There's about three million uh, American civilians. Um, there's the uniform military would be separate, but three million Americans who many of them spend years, if not decades, you know, working for the federal government. That would range from the Park Service to you know uh, the Department of Education to Social Security to the CIA and FBI. And and look, um, they have biases. They you know. Every president who's come in office has complained about the federal bureaucracy. Again, they are elected. They have a mandate. This new administration comes in and they feel that, you know, sometimes certain parts of the government are against their policies. When Ronald Reagan came in, he said he felt the State Department was sort of too liberal and wouldn't carry out his agenda in terms of countering communism. Barack Obama felt that generals in the Pentagon were, you know, floating these uh, numbers for how many U.S. troops Obama should spend to Afghanistan. He felt like he was getting boxed in and forced to send more troops than he wanted to. But no president has accused, you know, government servants, uh, career civil servants of carrying out a coup against him. And that's what's so different about the Trump era. Again, you know, they have biases. They want their turf. They want their organization to do well. Uh, they might be slow to implement programs they don't like. Um, you know, they might want the budget to grow for their organization. Um, but are they, you know, actively, you know, sitting in basements and secretly plotting to undermine democratically elected presidents? No. Uh, there's a ton of congressional committees that would love to catch government servants doing that. They all have subpoenas. There's, you know, they can send FBI agents. They can wiretap government servants if they want. Um, there's laws, the Hatch Act, you know, bars federal civil servants from engaging in political activities. Every uh, federal civil servant takes an oath of office. They swear to uphold and defend the Constitution. And I spoke to many of them, and they admitted that, you know, some of them, you know, they have colleagues that aren't that great, but, uh, you know, they 
you know, Joan Dempsey was one of the characters in the book. She worked in the intelligence community throughout her career. Um, she was uh, one of few women in in the in the uh, community, and she rose to the number three position in the CIA. You know, one of the top intelligence officials of her generation. And, and Dempsey said that she saw most of her colleagues as sort of, uh, you know, uh, do-gooders, but very cautious and sort of rule abiding and people who'd like to work for government. Um, but that that's her view. Again, I know many people are very cynical about government workers. Well, given, given Trump's, just setting Trump's rhetoric aside, is there any evidence that the last four years have seen more uh, activity by these uh, supposedly neutral parties to undermine the uh, the policies of the Trump administration? I would say no in most parts of the um, government. I think many people have left. Uh, you know, there's a lot of departures at the EPA. Uh, Michael Lewis, you know, wrote a book about this and other departments. I, I think the biggest question, you know, focuses on the FBI and the Trump-Russia investigation. Um, uh, James Baker, this is not James Baker, the former Secretary of State, but there's a James Baker who was the uh, the general counsel at the FBI. He worked uh, with uh, Jim Comey uh, throughout the summer of 2016 and then as the FBI was carrying out the Trump-Russia investigation. So that would be the big question. Was you know the FBI undermining Trump by investigating his campaign? Um, I you know kind of agree with the findings of this again an inspector general this is this independent position that was uh, put together so the inspector general for the justice department Michael Horowitz put together a 5000 word report about this interviewed Comey dozens of FBI agents under oath had access to all these intelligence records and Horowitz found that there was a legal justification for the launching of the FBI Trump Russia investigation it was not based on the dossier which was full of untruths. We can talk about the dossier separately, but when it was launched during the campaign, it was legally justified. After 9-11, the FBI, with lots of support from um, Democrats and Republicans, lowered the amount of evidence you needed to carry out of an investigation. That was to stop terrorism so that the FBI could quickly investigate anyone they wanted. So the FBI didn't have a tremendous amount of investigation, but it was a legally authorized opening of an investigation and just the other point I'll make is that the biggest thing the FBI could have done to, to undermine Donald Trump in the summer of 2016 was to leak the fact that they were investigating Trump and Russia. That would have sabotaged his campaign. They didn't do that. Um, we asked endlessly. I asked questions uh, to Justice Department officials about the dossier. Was Carter Page, we can talk about, you know, meeting with Russian officials. They refused to comment. They wouldn't give me anything. And then one specific little anecdote. Uh, I was doing this around the CIA um, and I interviewed John Brennan, the director of the CIA, when this is you know six weeks before the election. We were sitting in the director's office inside the CIA headquarters. You look out the windows there and there's this sort of verdant uh, uh, canopy of green trees outside. And I asked him, you know, Mr. Brennan, can you tell me that there are, the, are there these videotapes that Russia has uh, that are compromising you know, of then, you know, Republican candidate Trump. And Brennan paused, you know, sort of seemed surprised. And he said, I'm not going to comment on this one way or the other. I'm not confirming this. I'm not denying anything like that. And he said, look, David, I just want to urge you, you're going to hear a lot of crazy things about Donald Trump in the last six weeks of the election. You're going to hear a lot of crazy things about Hillary Clinton in the last six weeks of the election. And he urged me not to write about these allegations. You know, he, he said only write things that you can, you know, really prove definitively and that you know are factually correct. So again, one of the current conspiracy theories is that John Brennan was running around giving the dossier to everyone. Uh, just a last plug for journalists, we all had the dossier. Um, it all came from, you know, we got it from Glenn Simpson, the head of GPS Fusion. Uh, every major news organization had the dossier throughout the 2016 election. None of us could prove it. I worked for Reuters then. We didn't print a word of it. I think there was one oblique story that ran in the last days of the election that maybe mentioned it. But again, if the press was out to get Donald Trump during 2016, we all would have been writing about the dossier uh, and none, none of us did. No, we were writing about Hillary's emails and James Comey's decisions to, to yes. talk about if, them the whole time. If, during the campaign, if 
you know, the FBI hurt anybody, it was James Comey reopening the investigation days before the election. Um, and I, I talked at length, uh, you know, to Jim Baker, the general counsel, he said that he felt they had to do that. They had to be honest with Congress, um, honest with the country. And, you know, um, you know, but then again, that's another example of, of this idea of the FBI trying to sabotage Trump, you know, being questionable. Um, there's just, questions also, about what happens after the election, go. but go ahead. There, there well, was it's also murky. Yes. Look, and it's, it's also murky, right? Yes. Yeah. Just to be fair. What happened after the election? Yeah. So uh, I mentioned Carter Page earlier, but what was found in the inspector general's report is that there were four warrants to to this surveillance court. I mentioned the one created in the 70s. Uh, two of the, the first two warrants were, were proper. They were legally sufficient to surveil Carter Page, but the last two weren't. And that's wrong. Carter Page should not have been surveilled for how long he was surveilled. And there was a really troubling thing where uh, an FBI lawyer uh, changed an email. It was an email that the reason they were so suspicious of Carter Page, he had left the Trump campaign. He was no longer an advisor when he was surveilled, but he was meeting with all these Russian officials. And this FBI agent uh, had an email that said uh, Page was talking to the CIA as he was meeting with these uh, Russian officials. He was cooperating with the CIA. Uh, the low-level FBI lawyer changed the meaning of that email to say that Page was not uh, cooperating with the CIA. Uh, I heard from someone sort of you know close to that FBI lawyer that it was a mistake and it wasn't some nefarious thing. He, I don't know, he misunderstood uh, what the email or, or what Page's status was with the, with the CIA. But, you know, that lawyer is under investigation and should be, you know, he, those were improper surveillance warrants, the last two. Uh, there's a new report, again, by the inspector general that's found this, the, the, a systematic sloppiness in the applications the FBI puts to the surveillance court uh, and then the surveillance court itself has become like a rubber stamp. So I would say of all the institutions created to, you know, control the FBI, the, the FISA court uh, is the least effective. It's too secretive. Uh, the public should know more and they should be rejecting many more applications uh, to surveil people. But it wasn't simply, you know, Trump Tower was never surveilled. You know, it wasn't only Donald Trump. You know, this was this is a real problem for many Americans, many Muslim Americans after 9-11 were improperly surveilled. Um, and it's just a pattern I see of the president exaggerating uh, things that happened and things that went wrong. That's not a coup. He shouldn't have been surveilled that long, Carter Page, but that is not a coup. Why is the FISA court um, not doing a better job at balancing um, its role? I don't know. I, I'd call on those judges to do better. It's not an adversarial process. It's literally government lawyers presenting evidence that the FBI has put together about why they need to surveil it. They are primarily surveilling foreigners, but they're in the process, they pick up Americans and they are, you know, they'll see why is this American sort of hanging out with these, these Russian uh, diplomats that are, you know, believed to be intelligence operatives, you know, or Chinese diplomats. And so, uh, th that system needs to improve, uh, having you know these one-sided presentations uh from the justice department and the fbi just just is not working is there a reform that somebody might uh have in mind ron wyden or Rand paul or somebody in ron wyden or Rand, yeah to make them well and bill barr has said that there should be a higher level of evidence needed before an investigation of a political campaign can be carried out and I fully support that. I think that would be a great reform that would change. But again, you know, under the standards of evidence that existed in 2016, it was a legally opened uh, investigation. It's so there's there's problems. It's just the kind of the exaggeration uh, that's gone on, uh, you know, by to be frank, frankly, you know, by the president that the the you know he called the FBI agents who investigated him, uh, his several you know of his. AIDS, you know, lied to the FBI and were, were prosecuted for it. Um, you know, it, th th he called the FBI agents who did that investigation sort of human scum. You know, that's a gross exaggeration. And, um, you know, we can talk more about his use of the term deep state to kind of discredit institutions and, and people. 
Well, well, how about that? I mean, uh, it's it for all our concern. It is just Trump's political rhetoric. This is how he operates and how he gets um, his voters to stay in touch with him. So, um, is the deep state that he talks about a lie, or is it, as Trump supporters say, it's just his way of talking, and and he's just you know trying to make a larger, more metaphorical point. I would say um, it's, I think the coronavirus, this moment shows us how dangerous this is. Um, I mean, A, we sort of have to have a basic agreement on, on facts. And so is the coronavirus, you know, uh, how dangerous is it? You know, how, 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 what is the infection rate? What's the mortality rate? Is six feet enough? Is it not enough? And, you know, we have to sort of rely on some kind of government experts, scientific experts, medical experts, if we as a society and as a democracy are gonna effectively respond to this, these kind of challenges. So um, I, this, we, we, were, we were in such a sort of fierce uh, political era where it's sort of winner take all and you know, um, constant attacks on, on, on Trump. People say that you know, I, I have relatives who are big supporters of the president and they feel he's just savaged by the news media and the Democrats. But I, I just feel this sort of cycle of, of disdain and division and kind of conspiracy theories. And, you know, Rod, that, that uh, Donald Trump is a secret Russian agent. You know, Robert Mueller did not find collusion. I think it's very important that we accept, you know, the results of the Mueller report uh, and not say that Trump colluded with Russia uh, to win the election. Um, that was a very thorough investigation and collusion wasn't founded. And let's move on from that. But I, it's just a very dangerous kind of cycle of conspiracy theories and, you know, where we don't agree on facts. And, and you saw it in, in terms of the demonstrations, um, you know, just recently in, in Washington. Okay, well, two last questions for me, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to get what uh, you folks are thinking. But one of them, um, well, it's a little bit on Ukraine, just a little bit on Ukraine and what we learn from that, because... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, isn't Bill Barr even now investigating some of the folks who pushed for the Ukraine um, impeachment proceedings? Well, that's not wrong. It weren't the impeachment proceedings, but push for an, push for an investigation um, uh, into the Ukraine uh, events. He he's talked about it. He he's much more aggressive on on. He called, uh, he's much more focused on the Trump Russia investigation the FBI launched, and he recently called it, uh, you know, a travesty or one of the largest tragedies, travesties in, in U.S. history. So, look, maybe John Durham, this federal prosecutor, is going to find this astonishing uh, criminal conspiracy that Horowitz, the inspector general, you know, in a, you know, in, in dozens of interviews and thousands of, you know, pages of documents did not find. Um, but I, I, uh, there is a pattern with the president of sort of using uh, conspiracy theories to discredit his enemies. Uh, he's a very effective communicator and, communicator and then kind of keeping what he's doing secret. And so you mentioned the, the impeachment. You know, what I worry about is that the president is, um, you know, thinks he's surrounded by enemies. All these congressional committees want to know what's going on. And he's sort of forming like a parallel government with these aides in the White House who he will not, you know, allow to, to testify before Congress. Uh, you have Rudy Giuliani kind of covering out, ca carrying out a private foreign policy on behalf of the president. And so, you know, ironically, and this is sort of the, one of the concluding thoughts in the book, you know, under the guise of stopping a coup that doesn't exist, uh, Trump is creating a sort of shadow government, you know, of his own, filled with loyalists. There's no transparency. There's no public proceedings. We don't really know what's going on uh, inside the Trump White House. And so ironically, Trump is sort of creating a, a deep state of his own. Yeah. Didn't I read, uh, I guess uh, I read it in the New York Times, about uh, presidential findings that may exist. I believe the Times was a little vague on um, actually how much they saw, <laughs> but may exist that essentially, again, gives the president the power that the president has given himself the power to do whatever he deems necessary for the public good or his own his own system, his own position. 
executive orders or, yeah. or so yeah. covert action findings are different. Yeah, um, no, they were executive orders, I guess, but we don't know. We haven't seen them. They're, they're not, they're secret yeah. executive orders, I guess then. Yes. And, and, um, there is a certain, I, it's, this is and now I'm, I'm getting outside of my, my depth here. I would think they would at some point have to be made public. Um, but I don't know. I do know, and this is again, a reform of the seventies, but for covert action, you know, they have to be written findings and they go to both parties, the, the, the chair and the ranking member of the intelligence committees. They go to the speaker of the house um, and the, the minority leader in both the house and the Senate. So the Democrats would know about any, you know, if they're, if they're actually written findings about covert action, but um, I would think executive orders would have to eventually be made public, but a lot of unprecedented stuff is, is happening. And there has never been an impeachment where the president uh, successfully said, I, I, re I reject your subpoenas. You cannot speak to Mick Mulvaney, the White House chief of staff, about what he knew about Ukraine. You cannot look at any emails or any documents related to Ukraine. And, and this is, you know, this theory, that Bill Barr, is that the ultimate power is an election or an impeachment. And so to have a president say, I reject your impeachment, you know, this is shifting the balance of powers, as we were, we were talking about earlier. Again, it's, it's an extraordinary moment in American history how it's a question i ask in the book how powerful should a president be yeah well i mean i guess i'm revealing my own conspiracy theories i mean if you can write an executive order that says i don't have to reveal any of my executive orders because i'm the president what stops them I, from doing I, that there's a lot of leaks coming out of this white house um uh, you know, you mentioned uh, that, you know, there's about 3,000 appo political appointees that a, a new president puts in across the U.S. government. The British government has, you know, one or two at the head of each ministry. So um, I, the federal government's so big, I, I would think that executive orders that actually involve some change in immigration or environmental law, you know, or, or even, you know, the intelligence services would eventually leak because um, this White House leaks a lot. Um, due to the infighting, and that's my sense from from friends of mine who who cover this White House. Yeah, All I right. want to be optimistic. I, I... I want to think that there is some transparency. <laughs> well, you're pretty close to the Canadian border up there in Kennebunk. <laughs> so <you're okay. laughs> you too. <laughs> um, yeah, right. That's true. That's true. All right. One 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 last point to make, and then we'll take your chats, which I haven't seen any yet, but I'm sure I will see some questions through the chat pretty soon. Um, the media is part of the conspiracy in the deep state, according to Donald Trump and perhaps according to Bill Barr. I don't know what. Um, well, more broadly, I mean, I know you're going to say, well, we're not. But, is uh, you know, can you see why they might think that? Republicans sure. Might uh, think that or I think the whole much of the, I mean, most journalists worked for newspapers 10 or 20 years ago. The entire newspaper business model has collapsed. Uh, you know, the, and so the business model that's emerged is to go partisan. So uh, Fox News uh, and MSNBC are both very profitable. Fox News makes more. They make, uh, if I'm, if I can remember correctly, sort of more than a billion dollars a year in profit. Uh, MSNBC makes nearly a billion dollars a year in profit. Uh, anchors on both sides are making millions of dollars a year. And, you know, there's a, that's, you know, conspiracy theories and trashing your enemies. You know, uh, you froze a little bit there, but I'm sure you'll unfreeze quickly. In the meantime, I remind you folks to ask questions and and uh, throw in some questions to the chat. Sorry, I have it already. We're going to do a little refreshing, I think, and then I'll uh, I'll get some of your questions in.
Can you hear me? Hi. See me yet. Oh, there we go. Hi. I can hear you. Now you see me. Yeah. Good. I hear you. Are we still in the green room, Josh? Or are we back on the air, so to speak? We are back on air. Sorry Great. about those technical right. difficulties, folks, but we should be up and running again. Go ahead, David, wherever you left off. Or I think it was the questions. Remember, let's remember take, take, let's take questions. No, no, we'll, right. we'll right. I can talk I about the few. press anytime. We're terrible. Yeah, the there, there's bad reporters like in any profession. Let's go to questions. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on Eric Prince and his relationship to Betty DeVos, Betsy DeVos with this current administration? Does that come in your purview? Uh, it does. Uh, there were early uh, proposals by DeVos to try to use private security guards to kind of uh, uh, secure Afghanistan. Um, there were career officials in the uh, CIA and the military said this was a terrible idea, given that uh, some of the Blackwater guards uh, in Iraq um, had killed civilians in a, in a famous shooting there. One of the main characters in the book is actually an FBI agent who investigates the Blackwater shootings in Iraq. His name is Tom O'Connor. He's an amazing guy who's, you know, spends uh, decades of his life. Um, he says investigating evil in all of its forms. He investigates Al Qaeda, investigates Blackwater, he investigates white supremacists. So that proposal was 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 blocked eventually um, and stopped. And you, again, is that the deep state or are these people that have spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, diplomats and intelligence officers and military people, stopping a bad proposal? Um, from my time in Afghanistan, I would say that was not a good idea. Blackwater was sort of despised uh, throughout the Islamic world because of what happened in Baghdad. Hmm. What about the deep state being the powerful lobbies of which the industrial military complex is a part and Wall Street? Uh, is any What's the evidence for that? Um, I think they, you know, there are very large defense contractors that uh, have sway. Um, one of the interesting things about Trump, and I spoke to one aide, he's now a very senior official in the administration. Uh, Trump personally is opposed to getting the U.S. embroiled in more wars. Um, and so if, you know, it depends on the perspective of the person, but I would say both Obama and Trump resisted um, pressures. Famously in Syria, uh, Obama wouldn't go in. He was criticized for that. He pulled, Obama pulled U.S. troops out of Iraq. He did have the surge in Afghanistan, but Obama ended that surge also. And then Trump, you know, is an isolationist. He he has, you know, resisted uh, pressures, if there are, from corporate or, or defense contractors. He's spending a ton of money in the military, but he's not engaging us in war. So, again, this is kind of my shtick as a journalist. I just, the neat kind of theories don't always kind of work out Um you know, i.e. Donald Trump's in the pocket of corporate America and big defense firms, but he has not gotten us into a, 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 a large war overseas since he became president. But of course, the, but the military industrial complex that people talk about is about the money being spent, not necessarily about the weapons Correct. being expended. Correct. I mean, but at least the young in... Americans aren't, aren't dying. And, 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 you know, kill, I mean, anyway, I, I point taken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we live in a state where there's a big military contractor that uh, lobbies incessantly for its uh, for its contracts and gets pushback from other uh, places and other companies sometimes. So maybe they don't have it's as true. much sway they're, as we think. They're very powerful. Um, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, post Bush presidents and Bush GW, um, through Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and, you know, that idea became very powerful, had very many powerful tools. Did Barack, was Barack Obama continuing to expand that power using at the same level or, you know, given what you said about the drone strikes, or was he seeing ways to reduce the power of, a, of, a, the, of the presidency? He ended up, uh, he was, he was much more focused, Obama, on obeying the law so uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the, the um, I'll, we'll just jump right into the Snowden example. Um, what 
Snowden revealed, every program he talked about um, had been approved by the federal and the foreign intelligence surveillance court, the FISA court, like the Obama administration sort of, and a lot of it was kind of secret law. People didn't understand the, the extent of it, but Obama was very careful about, you know, following these, these guidelines that have been set up in the seventies. Um, and, you know, the problem was that he realized that he did not want to get, you know, U S troops forever in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so he embraced drone strikes as a way to protect the country he would be very vulnerable politically if, if there was another attack in the United States. And then he felt um, deadlocked in terms of Congress. And this, you know, when he was president, the Republicans were seen as an out of control Congress that was being obstructionist and carrying out too many investigations of Obama. Um, but so Republicans, or there's a feeling that Obama was using more and more executive orders to carry out his policies, even, you know, if he didn't have the votes to carry them out in Congress. So, you know, each president faced with this kind of deadlock as we get more and more divided and are more and more partisan, they are using executive orders. They would use kind of covert action overseas to just, you know, try to get things done. But uh, Obama did, you know, he stopped waterboarding, he stopped torture, he tried to close Guantanamo. He, but he, it was a, uh, a more lawful presidency, I guess, but just as, just as powerful. And as Donald Trump expanded the, or as he, just continued at the level of GW and Obama. Oh, it's a much more expansive interpretation of executive power. There, there's never been um, this refusal to just flat out that, I mean, all kinds of congressional investigations uh, into what his administration is doing and, and they're just stonewalling Congress. It's, it's a much more sweeping uh, thing. Just to the public, again, this, this, you know, I have ultimate authority. I'll decide when the States reopen you, you, uh, you know, George W. Bush never said that. Uh, the the using uh, funds that were appropriated by Congress for the Pentagon, uh, shifting, you know, the use of money that the legislative branch, the power of the purse, you know, uh, taking that money and then using it to build a wall along the border with Mexico, which Congress did not want that money to be used for. Uh, that was the Democratic vote of Congress. So Democrats, small d. And to have a president just say, nope, I'm going to take that money and spend it how I want. No president has done that. No modern president, no, no president since, since Nixon. Did Nixon spend money that it wasn't authorized? Uh, slush funds and, you know, <laughs> the oh, famous oh, I see. money oh, the to, to burglarize stuff, right. the, the Watergate stuff. But it's, right, right. It, it's, a, it's, right. a, it's, a, it's a very, very sweeping uh, firing the inspector general. Uh, that's going to overlook uh, the the economic uh, you know uh, support funds in, in the wake of coronavirus, and and appointing to replace him a, a White House lawyer who's you know seen as a real loyalist uh, versus an independent figure. Again, this is all getting rid of these 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 powers that were created in the '70s to restrict presidents. Or uh, it's a cumbersome system, you know, all these branches, and it and it's hard to get stuff done in Washington. But it was designed uh, that way. And we've seen that when you concentrate power, when there isn't transparency, it, it can lead to abuses and, and corruption. Around the world. I mean, we, we Americans prided ourselves on being, having a democracy that didn't fall victim to strongmen. But apparently, we don't have as much control over that as we thought. And the Bill Bars of the world said, no, you don't, not until we have an election. Well, there's also, but you know, the argument is that it's sort of paralysis and that it's too messy and you need presidents who, you know, again, it's, there's the, the stone, if, if you just go back to the Obama administration, there was a sense that Mitch McConnell was blocking everything. Um, and, and that that was an abuse of congressional power. Now it's flipped and it's, you know, it's seen as good. Democrats think it's good that Nancy Pelosi and Schumer are, are sort of fighting back, but um, anyway, it's, it's, this is an enor enormously important moment in American history. Um, Trump is setting precedents that are going to exist for future presidents, whether they're, you know, Republicans or, or Democrats. Right. Um, another question, what happened to the quiet resistance group that had the anonymous op-ed in the New York times? Would you say there are other groups covertly trying to push against Trump's craziness to put it mildly? Um, 
I don't know who Anonymous is. I, I worked for the New York Times for 15 years, so I, I think there is an Anonymous, and uh, I think it was a it's it's a fairly senior official. Uh, I think people are sort of gradually leaving government. Um, just an anecdote: I mentioned uh, Tom O'Connor, this FBI agent who he was just an ex- he he was a, a police officer in Western Massachusetts. Uh, he he joins the FBI. He investigates the U.S. coal bombing in Yemen, and he recovers the bodies of the sailors from the coal. 9-11, he's in the Pentagon. Uh, you know, he and his uh, fellow agents recovered uh, 2,000 bags of human remains from the Pentagon. And so um, Tom O'Connor retired recently on 9-11. He and, he and his wife are both FBI agents. Uh, he, you know, he retired on 9-11. Um, he fought for these first responders, uh, you know, uh, to get more rewards as they're all getting different cancers. And he was with John Stewart that day. John Stewart testified before Congress. And, and you know, John Stewart was very angry that day about why Congress wasn't funding these first responders, these people that have been serving and working in government for so long. And, and so was Tom O'Connor. So he, you know, left the FBI and I asked him sort of, what are you going to do? And I, I sort of asked him at one point, would you ever, you know, would you want to run for office? Maybe you were so, you know, angry at Congress and could you go in and clean things up. Uh, and he said, no, you know, I'd, I'd want to do something that, you know, has some honor to it or some meaning. And that's a really dangerous uh, thing for me to hear that someone who's, you know, worked, you know, I think helped people. Again, there's bad FBI, there's no question, but this, this guy spent his career investigating, you know, he called it evil in all of its forms. But, um, and I, I sensed from him and others a kind of disgust with our political system, a disgust with both sides. I, I found that the CIA and FBI are divided like the rest of the country. There's a chunk of FBI agents that love President Trump, and there's a chunk that don't like him. Same thing in the CIA. But to, I just worry that you know these long-term government officials, they're not great. Some of them are bureaucrats. Some of them are lazy. But they're needed. You know, We need a, a lean, effective government. Again, we see that with coronavirus, that they're just going to get sick of the scrum and the constant attacks and the, the media attacking them, politicians attacking them, and we just won't have people interested in, in public service anymore. Are we seeing that? Are we seeing a decrease in applications at the, you know, at the federal at, level? At the, at the FBI, they, they say they're, they're consistent. Uh, during the shutdown, which was about funding for the wall, uh, there were a lot of FBI agents who were angry because they didn't get paid for, you know, I, I believe it was two months. It was the longest shutdown in U.S. history. Uh, they set up food pantries in FBI offices around the country. Um, there were, um, you know, the staffers at FBI coming in in tears and asking their supervisors for help. Uh, some agents were afraid that they couldn't, they wouldn't be able to make a credit card payment, and then they'd fail their credit history. And if you have a bad credit history, you're seen as maybe vulnerable to blackmail by, you know, a foreign power by, you know, Russian operatives or something. So they were very frustrated. But again, they. Some were angry at Trump, some were angry at Democrats, but that alienation from our democracy, you know, from the democratic process is really, you know, I think corrosive and, and dangerous for this country in the long term. Corrosive and dangerous enough to um, allow somebody to say, these elections are false, I'm not going to abide by them, or we're not going to have them. Yeah, and, and I, I would just, um, just kind of gets back to your media question. Um, I, if, if, you know, for conservatives or liberals, um, how do I want to put this? If, if, um, if you're conservative, you know, and you're seeing these like incredible things on Facebook and online and they're not being reported in sort of the, you know, mainstream media, you know, I'd, I'd urge people, I'd use as my gauge if I was a conservative, the Wall Street Journal, the news section of the, of the paper, not the opinion section. One thing about, you know, newspapers and the New Yorker where I work and, is that you know when we publish a story, when I publish a story, a lawyer reads it. There are libel laws that allow me to get sued for defaming someone, something, for putting something on that's false. That's true for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, you know, the New York Times, uh, your local papers, uh, many, many outlets. That is not true for Twitter or Facebook or Google. They can put anything on those platforms. They have no responsibility whatsoever if what's online, whether it's true or not, whether it slanders people, whether it demeans people. This was written in, it was actually Ron Wyden who put in this language to help the internet grow that gave them an exemption 
from the libel laws that you know exist for the rest of the uh, you know um, media. And then again, if you're on the left and you hear something about Donald Trump is a Russian agent, and it's not you know in the New York Times, which you know leans left, it's probably not true. So if you're a conservative, it's not in the Wall Street Journal and the news pages. It's probably not true. And I would ask people to you know be skeptical about what you're reading online. Um, if you can be as skeptical as you want about the mainstream media, but be equally skeptical about everything you're reading online. David, I read in, I'm looking for the page, but somewhere in here you say, you talk about President Trump's miss, uh, quote, his lies, and that uh, you use the Washington Post as the example of the, the media that is counting his lies and misstatements. Um, Donald Trump looks at the Washington Post and says, look, there's the example of the, the Amazon media, Washington the deep Post. state media, the Amazon Washington Post. Yeah, the Jeff Bezos, Amazon Washington Post. There's the example of them reporting about things that um, are a disservice to the country and not true about me. I, I believe he'll say that, too. So, I mean, why should I mean, I can see why somebody would say, why, why should I read a paper that tells me the president's lying every counts the lies that the president tells every day? They claim are lies. Well, um, I'm biased because I'm a, I'm a journalist. Um, you know, there's hundreds of reporters who, who cover the White House. Um, the Washington Post fact checker, you know, is, is edited and there's, and there's all these sort of checks in the, into their work. So, you know, either, either the president is telling all these lies every day that, that sort of all the fact checking organizations, I do cite the Post, agree, you know, that he's making false or exaggerated statements. Um, I, I believe reporters. I believe in journalism. I don't get a memo every day telling me what to write. Um, I'm. It's not fair to invoke him. I'm at the New Yorker. I edit Ronan Farrow. I'm very proud of the stories, you know, we did about Harvey Weinstein. We vetted them very carefully because he could have sued us. But you know, I believe in journalism. I think most journalists want to get as close to the truth as they can get. They make mistakes. People have personal biases. So I trust the Washington Post fact checker. I'm biased as an establishment journalist. Uh, and, you know, they have the president having, you know, made 15,000 false or exaggerated claims since he came into office. It's increased every year he has been in office. So if I have to guess, is the problem hundreds of journalists all being part of a plot to undermine Donald Trump? Or is the problem Donald Trump repeatedly lying and exaggerating? I am going to believe those journalists. I have a bias, you know. Uh, again, there's bad journalists, but I, I believe in the processes we follow, the fear we have of lawsuits and slanders. We, it's embarrassing if you have to run a correction of your story that actually really matters to you professionally. And so, um, you know, that's 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 where I stand. And people can choose to believe the president um, over us, but my again, my investigation into his claim that there is a deep state that is carrying out a coup against him. I did not find evidence of that. I had members of the Trump administration tell me that was an exaggeration. They agreed that there was not a deep state coup against the president. And again, it is a savvy political operator, Donald Trump, using conspiracy theories. And this is what he's done. He's done throughout his political career to discredit his opponents. Birtherism and Barack Obama, using a conspiracy theory to discredit your opponent and yet he simultaneously, he controls information by blocking Congress from getting information that prevents Congress from sort of being able to do its job correctly. By calling the media fake news, it discredits us, it confuses people, and then he limits access to who he's meeting with in the White House, you know, who he's calling, uh, you know, less and less disclosure about those, those kinds of things. And it's very effective. It's a strategy. He knows what he's doing. He's a you know brilliant at messaging. Um, but I you know I come down on the side of most journalists, and I think the president has a problem in terms of exaggerating uh, facts and and making claims that are exaggerated. Another question is: President Trump's complaints about the deep state due to his not replacing enough of Obama's staff with his own people in 2017. Uh, again. At this point, I, I would, he's been president for three years. Uh, he's, he can, can fire, um, you know, he did fire the director of the FBI. Um, so, 
you know, all this talk too of, of Hillary Clinton and the, the Russia uranium deal and all of her illegalities, uh, you know, the Republicans had full control of the House and the Senate for the first two years. They still control the Senate. Uh, the president has, you know, full control of the Justice Department. And so, you know, if he doesn't have control of the government after three years, he should be more effective, you know, in, in placing people to run these departments. Uh, you know, to his credit, he's he's done a tremendous amount of change to the immigration system. Um, you know, he, he has enacted sweeping environmental changes. So, um, you know, he has a lot of power. He has one House of Congress. So I, I you know, I, I, I question, I would just, I, I would, I, I, in, in the first year, yes, but he's had plenty of time to, to clean house at this point, uh, in my view. Were our Jim Comey and Bob Mueller part of the deep state or part of the solution? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, I would, so I don't like the term deep state. Um, so I didn't find a deep state. Are, are Bob Mueller and Jim Comey part of the, let's say, the permanent government? Are they career government servants? Um, those are more neutral terms. Yes. Um, you know, did they work in government? You know, Bob Mueller spent his whole career, you know, as a federal prosecutor and then as FBI director. Uh, he did some things that were questioned after 9-11 in terms of, you know, surveillance of mosques and other things. Um, so I think they fit in the category of, you know, career uh, government officials uh, who maybe have a, you know, pro-Washington viewpoint, but they were not, you know, acting and carrying out plots against, you know, uh, President George W. Bush, you know, or President Obama. Uh, they operated within the confines of this system that was, again, created in the 70s. Uh, the book started out with a former uh, CIA operative. He's a character in the book, you know, who complained to me. Also, he said that we didn't like all this oversight and all these rules um, when they came out in the CIA, but they came to accept them because there was like a rules of the road. And if you're going to go spy in a foreign country, if you're going to, you know, detain someone and how do you interrogate them, there was ways to do it because CIA operatives fear, you know, what happened after 9-11. They carried out these enhanced interrogation techniques, these torture techniques. A new president was elected. Uh, and there was a, a, an investigation that that Obama uh, carried out. It's by John Durham, the same person that Bill Barr has investigated in the FBI. But John Durham looked at the, the the torture that went on and decided there weren't criminal charges to bring because the the sitting president at the time had said it was legal. So they they say it's the political class, the, the lifelong Justice Department workers, the lifelong FBI people, the, the lifelong CIA people. They they claim, and I know people will roll their eyes that they're abiding by these rules, you know, they, they manage Congress, like clearly I'm not saying they do everything, but they claim it's the political class that's now, you know, exaggerating intelligence or bearing intelligence, depending on what helps them politically. And it's the political class and the president, you know, you know, alleging these conspiracies and they claim they're not true. And, and it's, it's just become score political points in any way you can, scorched earth, and it's it's damaging these institutions. It's damaging the public's view of these institutions. And and so the members, sorry, long answer. Um, these career people, diplomats, and others say the political class has got, to, and the media has to kind of turn down the temperature, and and stop uh, this this cycle of attacks. Um, that reminds me, of something you brought up in, up in the book about the uh, about uh, Schiff and when Schiff was proceeding with his uh, charges. Uh, heard the uh, the uh, Republican uh, yep. representative from Texas. He didn't. He thought Schiff was. Uh, I forget the actual words that you used that he used, but he didn't think Schiff was fair in his yes. in his uh, presentation. So there was um, during the Trump Russia investigation, and I want to get this right. I think Schiff said that there was uh, there was beyond circumstantial evidence of collusion between Trump and Russia. Robert Mueller didn't find that. And back to, is, is Robert Mueller, a, how can Robert Mueller be a member of the deep state who's betraying Donald Trump when Robert Mueller essentially exonerated Donald Trump of collusion with Russia? Uh, there was the issue of, of Trump uh, trying to interfere in the investigation, but 
and that's this idea of, you know, is Bob Mueller this kind of straight shooter? Is Tony Fauci doing the level best he can with the information he has to try to come to conclusions about coronavirus? You know, neither are perfect, but I think if we, you know, think that no one is, you know, if we don't have kind of some kind of apolitical expert, some belief in basic facts, whether it's the reported piece you you see on the newspaper or the book you read or a government report, you know, how how do we govern? But but that was the allegation from Will Hurd against uh, Adam Schiff that he, that the Democrats knew that there wasn't clear evidence of Trump colluding with the Russians, but Schiff just kept at it and had it in the headlines and on TV every night because it was politically powerful. And just the last thing about Hurd, he's a character in the book as well. He was actually a CIA officer for about a decade, ran for Congress. Uh, he's a moderate Republican, um, uh, one of the few African Americans uh, in Congress uh, that are Republicans. But when it came to impeachment, uh, you know, he he came firmly down. Uh, he talks about, and it was amazing to see this Gulf where you, you meet Adam Schiff and Adam Schiff's getting death threats, but Adam Schiff resents the president, thinks he's a tremendous threat to democracy and uh, an existential threat to the future of, of the American Republic as we know it. And then you talk to Republicans like Will Hurd and they'll say, look, Trump is unorthodox. You know, he's kind of amateurish. That was the term Hurd used uh, for the call with Ukraine's president. And, you know, he thinks that, that there were many moderate Republicans feel that Democrats are just overreacting to Trump, this Trump derangement syndrome. And it's just amazing, again, and I think it's, it's dangerous, the gap in sort of the, the two realities about, you know, what, what does Trump represent? Well, where are you? Where are you in that uh, pendulum <laughs> that swings? I, I don't want to go too forth. far. Like, I, 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 um, I think it's really important for journalists to not, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say who people should vote for. And a lot of journalists are doing it. There's plenty of people trashing the president or saying the president's great. And, you know, maybe I've, you know, I'm sure people will say, since I say I didn't find evidence of a deep state, I'm, I'm therefore anti-Trump. But I, I'm, I'm just trying to present my honest effort in, you know, dozens of interviews over about an 18 month period that I did not find, again, Every president has been frustrated with bureaucracies. Yes, Minister was a great television series. We have to be on the FBI and the CIA. They're very powerful. In the digital age, you know, there's, it's easier to surveil us than ever. It's easier than ever to, to violate our privacy. But I think the, what I found is that the, the most powerful way to do that is to have all three branches of government all over the FBI and the CIA, to have the press all over them, to, to force more transparency it's cumbersome, it's chaotic, but you know, rather than more secrecy and concentrating power, that, that's what's led us to abuses in the past. And you know, I, I found what I found, but I'm not gonna sit here and read the president's mind or, or call him names, you know, and enough of that's going on, or, or call you know, Adam Schiff's name. I think it's important for journalists to keep their mouth shut at, at certain points and, and talk about the facts they know. Well, maybe you answered this, but existential threat to democracy, or 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 is or even are the policies that have unfolded an existential threat to democracy? I worry about. It appears to be the appointment of um, you know. Uh, again, I, I let me step back and say I, I applaud every member, every senator on the Senate Intelligence Committee, and the chair, you know, uh, Richard Burr of North Carolina, that sat there, you know, and voted for this report and affirmed today that, you know, Russia helped Donald Trump in the election. That is the opposite of the messaging, the political messaging that the president wants. You know, God bless them for, for doing that today. And I, so I do think the appointment of, you know, John Ratcliffe, who's a member of the House, who insists that, you know, that that's false and there never was any help. And the real issue was that Ukraine was, you know, interfering in the election and not Russia. That makes me nervous that you're you're putting there have to be people in government positions who are trying their level best to get basic facts across. There have to be journalists that are doing that. And you can't have every single position filled with a political player who will twist the facts. Again, we can't function as a democracy. I'll say it again and again, coronavirus shows we can't help each other, you know, survive this pandemic if we can't agree on basic facts. 
Here's here's a, a last question from a list, uh, from a viewer. Have you heard of three felonies a day? The idea is that the typical American commits three felonies per day, and they can be prosecuted and imprisoned for them if the government decided to. The point is that criminal law and regulations have gotten so vast that anyone can be got through selective enforcement. Any thoughts on this? I don't know if that is true, but I think that again shows how we need more transparency. And um, I guess I would just say, I would hope that we would each get a trial by jury. This goes back to our constitution and it'd be wrong if prosecutors can bring you or me uh, you know, bef to trial, they have that power, but we can't go to jail unless a, a jury of our peers and maybe you know, they can fake the evidence in the trial. I would think the judge would help us. Um, so I think that's possible, but that's why you know, we need a divided system where there aren't just you know prosecutors controlled by you know an executive branch, uh, and and then there's you know are, are, are there's juries, there's there's legislators who will want to expose that that that's happening. Uh, there's a press that wants to expose it. Lots of divided powers, lots of fights, chaos. But hopefully that that protects uh, all of us. That was a great great question. I imagine there are some people who are. Um... Uh, experienced uh, part of the mass incarcerations of the last 20 years who would say that's already taken place. That's, that is true. And I, you know, I, I, I just, uh, it's true. And that's racism is one of our biggest problems, but I would, um, it's true. I just, I guess it's, that's race. I would, I would, I, I, I don't have a good answer to that one. Um, but th that's really a cultural problem, a problem we've all had as a country through for generations, um, you know, and it's inexcusable. And I, I uh, versus a plot that there were, you know, that was carried out secretly by uh, government officials, if that makes any sense. Um, it does. It's a core yeah. structural psychological bigotry that runs up and down throughout Americans versus, you know, a secret organization was carrying this out without you know, all of us knowing, but it's a, it's a horrible problem and it, it continues today. So we're going to have a pretty, probably a pretty rambunctious election and, uh, and a campaign and an election. Um, and it may be partially like this. Uh, does that, <laughs> does that uh, concern you in any way, shape or form? Or do you feel that there's still transparency and there's still access taking place throughout this pandemic? I worry. I mean, I one of the big changes is you know uh, the dark money in elections and the, the the changes that happen with the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United. So as journalists, we don't know where you know what all these super PACs are doing. Uh, the the campaigns being waged online. Again, I'd I'd ask people to be more skeptical of what you read online than what you're seeing in your your newspaper or, or websites that that you trust that are sort of established. Um, Journalism, and you can again read to the right or read to the left, but um, try to be skeptical about where your information's uh, coming from. Uh, there's a ton of misinformation out there. That would be misinformation is bad information that is spread by people who don't realize it's bad information. Disinformation is intentionally spreading false information to kind of, you know, cause discord and, and fear. And there's just going to be a lot of that. I, I think Americans are very savvy. And I, you know, I think they'll figure out this election. There'll be a lot of yelling and screaming. The vote will happen. I think it's really healthy for the country. We have an election coming up and we should all accept the results of the election. You know, we have this incredible system where local counties are carrying out the elections across the boat, I, across the country. I don't think there's some vast plot to change, you know, the results of our elections. I could be wrong. You know, we, again, we have to sort of believe in some basic facts and truths and you know vote yell if you want not violence vote and, and use your voice but no violence all right david road will leave that as the last word that's a good way to go out i appreciate it indeed thank you the fbi the cia and the truth about america's deep state thank you david road thank you so much steve and candace and thank you folks yeah thank you uh thank you both so much for um coming on tonight and talking to us. Uh, journalism is so important. So thank you both for your work.
Um, and thank you to the viewers as well for joining us. If you're interested in upcoming programming, um, you can follow us by clicking the follow button right at the top uh, right corner of your screen. Um, again, please buy the book. Um, and if you are able and interested uh, in more town hall stuff, um, please donate if you can. Um, but thank you so much to both of you again. And uh, have a great night, everybody. <laughs>